Today we have one of those almost mythical, perfect blue sky days here on the Isle of Man and I'm going to use this rare opportunity to go out tonight to try and capture a Milky Way panoramic image. An image that I've been planning in my head for the best part of a year. Now the purpose of this video is just to outline my methodology for capturing this image that I've been dreaming about for so long. Now panoramic images are images that have a long thin aspect ratio with three to one being one of the most popular ratios. Now it is possible to simply crop into a super wide angle image to create the illusion of a panorama but I'm going to show you a much more powerful method a method that involves stitching together numerous images to create a super high resolution and highly detailed Milky Way panoramic image. Let's start with when and where. And this very much depends on where you live. For me in the Northern Hemisphere, my Milky Way season extends from about March through to October. And this is when the Milky Way core becomes visible above the horizon line. Early on in the season, in March-April time, the belt of the Milky Way is found quite low within the eastern sky, extending from north to south across that. And the Milky Way core becomes visible in the hours just before dawn. As the season progresses, that belt steadily gets higher and higher into the night sky, so that by the end of the season, kind of August, September sort of time, it extends almost directly straight above just as darkness falls. So very much the preference if you're trying to get Milky Way panoramas is to shoot early in the season. It's currently April and tonight the Milky Way core rises above the horizon at about 3 a.m. <laughs> Painfully early. Um, and even worse, astronomical twilight starts to kick in from about 4 a.m. And this has the effect of essentially washing away the details in the actual Milky Way as the dawn light starts to creep above the horizon line. So in effect, I've got a one hour shooting window tonight to shoot this Milky Way panorama at its best. There's no moon tonight and we should hopefully have perfectly clear skies. Make sure you have both of these components if you're trying to shoot a Milky Way panorama. Now I'd recommend using apps like Stellarium and Photopills to help you pre-visualize where the Milky Way is going to be within the night sky at a particular location at a particular time. These apps can also help with trying to master some of the variables that I've covered so far, like astronomical twilight and moon phase, for example. So use those two apps and you'll be well on the way to getting your panorama. When choosing your shooting location, you need to look for an area that has a clear view from north to south. What you're looking for is big, open, totally unobscured skies. And ideally, you want to look for a location that doesn't suffer too badly from light pollution. Finally, you need to think about the foregrounds that you're going to try and work into your panorama to try and take it to another level. Things like mountains, trees or buildings, for example. So use an app like Photopills to start to pre-visualize the relationship between these locations and the Milky Way belt behind them. Lens choice. Now starting with super wide angle lenses like the 14mm lens I've got here. These lenses make Milky Way panoramas very quick and very simple to capture because it's possible to capture the full arc of the Milky Way in as little as three or four shots. However, these kind of lenses do suffer from a lot of distortion, which potentially can make stitching the images together quite challenging. At the other end of the scale, you've got longer focal lengths like 35mm or 50mm, like this lens here, for example. These lenses generally suffer from less distortion. So the editing software you're using will be able to stitch the images together far more easily. Also, using these kind of lenses, 
can generate incredibly high resolution and incredibly detailed panoramic images of the Milky Way too. So generally they produce better results. However, they are more difficult to use and certainly more time consuming because to get the full belt of the Milky Way, you may need to take 20 or 30 shots potentially if you're extending to multiple rows. So they can be very challenging. So I'd recommend for anyone starting out to start with a wider lens and nail down the technique before progressing on to those longer focal lengths. The very best lenses for the job tend to be fast wide aperture prime lenses. Now the overlapping process and the stitching does mitigate imperfections in the corners of your lens like coma for example to a large extent. So I tend to find that panoramic images at night tend to be a little bit more forgiving on lens quality than single shot astrophotography images. Now tonight I'm going to be using the Nikon 20mm 1.8S which gives me a fairly wide field of view without too much extreme distortion and the fast 1.8 aperture will help me suck in as much of that valuable light as possible. Now on to tripods. You want to make sure that you're shooting with a strong and stable tripod and when you're out in the field you want to set it up on the most stable ground that you can find. There's no point setting it up on sand for example. Um, once you've got that set up, then the absolute key thing here is you need to try and level your tripod. Not, I'm not talking about your tripod head here, the tripod itself. And usually the easiest way to do this is via a bubble level. Many tripods have these built into the top of the legs. Um, if you don't, then you can actually buy separate bubble levels like this one that go in between your tripod head and your tripod. Use that to level your tripod out. Once you've got that level, then you can mount your camera to your tripod head and then you need to level that independently. You can use the inbuilt, inbuilt uh, spirit level in live view to do that or you can use the spirit level that's often built into tripod heads itself. Once you're content you've got that level as well, then you can try panning your camera 180 degrees through the scene and you'll very quickly find out whether you've got your camera level or not. Overlap. To successfully stitch your independent images together, you need to build some overlap between the frames to allow your editing software to blend them together seamlessly. Generally speaking, more overlap is better than less because it gives you that safety net and generally leads to more accurate and reliable stitching. With wide angle lenses, because of the distortions, it's a good idea to build quite a lot of overlap between your images. So tonight with my 20 mil lens, I'm gonna go for an overlap of about 50%. And if you're just starting out with Milky Way panoramas, I would say that's a good place to start. Shooting in portrait orientation is generally the best idea as it allows you to maximize your vertical real estate as you sweep across the image. And this is where bits of equipment like the L bracket I've got on my camera here really comes into its own because if you flop the camera off the side of the actual tripod head, then your actual axis of rotation in relation to your camera is slightly off, which potentially may cause some stitching issues. Equipment like nodal rails can be very useful as well because they help to overcome the issue of parallax in your panoramic stitching. But I don't have a nodal rail, so I'm not gonna talk about them. Calculating your overlap by eye in the dark is a really bad idea because you're leaving yourself open to making mistakes, catastrophic mistakes. So a much better method is to calculate your degree field of view. And thankfully, photo pills can do that for you for any of your focal lengths. With my 20 mil lens here, when it's in portrait orientation, its horizontal field of view is 60 degrees. 
So if I halve that, that gives me 30 degrees. And here's the magic bit. Most panoramic heads, or indeed tripod heads, will have 360 degree uh, markings right around the panning base. So all I have to do is simply between each of my frames, move and pan my tripod head by 30 degrees and voila, camera settings. Now I'm not gonna go into any great detail here, but basically you just have to optimize your camera settings for low light. So that means opening your aperture up wide, raising your ISO and using longer shutter speeds in relation to your focal length. It's all kind of standard astrophotography stuff. Um, but also I'd really recommend setting your white balance so it's the same. So generally speaking, I'd recommend something like 3,800 to 4,500 Kelvin and get your focus set to infinity locked off before you start. The key message here is make sure that all of your settings stay exactly the same for every single frame of your panorama. Any changes in exposure, focus, or white balance between your frames has the potential to utterly destroy your image. Technique. Now it's always best to shoot your panoramas wider, both horizontally and vertically, than you need to. This allows you to crop into your final image. And this helps you eradicate the edges, which tend to suffer quite significantly in the stitching process. I'd recommend having a healthy amount of sky above the top of your Milky Way arch and below your main foreground interest for that reason. So really keep that in mind when you're out in the field. Um, the first thing that I would generally do when I get on site is take a test shot of the middle of the Milky Way arch where it's at its highest. This will allow you to get a sense for how it sits within the composition, but most importantly will allow you to judge whether the focal length you're using is able to capture the Milky Way arch within a single panoramic sweep or whether further additional rows are going to be necessary. Tonight, I'm gonna to start by shooting on the left of the scene, which is the far north. And in this area of the sky, the stars are gradually sinking towards the horizon. Whereas on the right-hand side, which is the far south, the stars are actually rising away from the horizon. So in theory, in my mind, if I start on the left-hand side and then work across the image to where the Milky Way core is rising, then the Milky Way core will rise into my image as I'm taking it. A quick little tip here is take a mental note of the degree markings for where you start your panorama from. If you're gonna be taking a multi-row panorama, that will be really invaluable information when you have to start your second row. Once you take your first image in your panorama sequence, you need to work quickly to get the entire panorama sequence completed. And the reason for this is pretty straightforward. Earth's rotation is constantly changing the scene in front of you. So if you take too long to capture the panorama, then your editing software is gonna have a potentially difficult time stitching and blending those images together seamlessly. So it really is a race against time. Generally, I'd recommend getting your panorama sequence of images more than once because it gives you a nice safety net in case you muck up one of the frames. All it takes is one frame to be off for the whole panorama to fall apart. So if you take the panorama multiple times, you give yourself that little comfort that it's probably going to be okay. If you're shooting multiple rows within a panorama, once you've, you've completed your first row, then you need to pan your camera back to its starting position. And then very carefully, you need to lift the camera up 50% while still keeping it level um, to essentially give you your starting position for the second row. Um, a lot of tripod heads will have degree markings for tilt, so you can use exactly the same field of view principle that I touched upon earlier. 
If your tripod head does not have this, then you're gonna to have to freestyle a little bit by looking for a bright reference star in your frame and judging your overlap based on that. Depending on the nature of the foreground subject, such as its distance to camera and the speed that it takes to secure your panoramic images, it may not be possible to secure your optimum sky and your optimum foreground all within single exposures. And in my experience, more often than not, this tends to be the case. So tonight I'm gonna to take two panoramic images. One, I'm gonna optimize my settings to get the best from the night sky. And the second panorama, I'm gonna optimize my settings to get the best out of my foreground. And then I'll simply blend both of those images together. Using the technique I outlined in the early hours of the next morning, I managed to capture this Milky Way panorama image. I'm extremely happy with how this shot turned out with little Winky Lighthouse, which is a firm favourite of mine, sitting perfectly under the Milky Way's arch. As far as I'm aware, this is the only image of its kind taken of this lighthouse. The final image is 27,000 pixels wide and captured across 16 images, 8 for the sky and 8 for the foreground. I used Photoshop's Merge to Panorama feature to stitch the images together and it did a pretty solid job overall. My Photoshop work file was over 5 gigabytes in size, so the editing was painfully slow and pretty challenging to be honest, but it was certainly worth it. I utterly love this shot and I'm getting it printed for my office wall as soon as I can. But that's a wrap for today. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who picked up a copy of my ebook. I really appreciate the support. It means an awful lot to me. Um, if you do have any thoughts on the image in today's video or questions on Milky Way panoramas in general, pop them down below in the comments. Um, but until my next video, whenever that is, take care everyone.